Welcome to this wealth creation series as we explore principles for abundant life. This series forms part of our Christian growth track, which equips you to find and fulfill your life purpose. To get the most out of this session, find a quiet space or use earphones. Kindly register to receive the links for the remainder of this free series by contacting info at cohcc.net or 079-520-2088. Also order your copy of the Power to Create Wealth book and join an on-site or online small group discussion after each session. Help us spread this message via sharing it on Facebook or by making a financial donation. And, and, then, and then about three, four years ago, four years ago, I had this dream where I arrived at our church at the time and in broad daylight, and I found the church to, to be robbed. And, and incidentally, um, the, the night before, I was watching Batman or The Begins or something like that with my sons, and, and Liam Neeson was playing the lead role. In, in, he was the villain in the story. And so Liam Neeson was also in my dream. He was the lead thief. And so when I confronted Liam in, in that, that real tone that he, that he addressed um, the, the abductors of his daughter in Taken, he said, what is your problem? <laughs> so why do you have a problem with me stealing from God's people? He said, do you God's people leave doors open and that gives us the legal right to rob them, to steal from them? It's always been the norm. Why do you suddenly have a problem with that? That was in my dream and I... And I woke up in a cold sweat. And I said, Lord, what's going on? And, and God began to speak to me and he said, it's true. It's, it, it, it's true that my children are being robbed. The devil is stealing from them, killing and destroying their lives, their, their wealth, their finances. Because they are leaving doors open. I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? He said, I want to talk to you about wealth. Remember 20 years before, he said, one day I will talk to you about wealth. But it took 20 years, two decades. And he says, now I want to talk to you about wealth. I said, Lord, what book do you want me to read? I've got 10 books on prosperity. Which book? I, we, was, we were living for a two-week break. And he said, take only your Bible and read it from Genesis to Revelation. I'm going to talk to you about wealth. And as I opened the Bible, it was like the wealth plan of God just opened up to me. And all the puzzle pieces came together. And that's what was captured in the, in the books that, that you hold. And, and, and this seminar and series that, that we're going to do. And I did this biblical survey and I found the most amazing journey of wealth creation. And it's almost like Israel's journey throughout uh, the Bible is, is like a parallel of your wealth creation journey and mine. And so I learned one thing and that is that covenant people in Scripture were always exceedingly blessed. Can I say that again? Covenant people in the Bible was exceedingly blessed. Think about the Jewish people. They're the covenant people of God. They still live in the old covenant. But think that the Jewish people is one of the smallest groupings of people in the world, yet they own some of the largest portions of wealth around the world. And how much more you and I who live in a new covenant, a better covenant. In fact, I think Paul calls it in the Amplified, he says, a more advantageous covenant than that of the Jews. God's intention is to bless his children so that we would become a blessing to other people. That was the promise given, the covenant promise to Abram. I'm going to bless you so much, Abram, that the nations will be blessed on your account. But how can you and I become a blessing to nations? How can we become the light of the world if we struggle to pay our own water and lights account? And so God wants to upgrade, I believe, his children so that we can learn to close the open doors, to shut out the enemy that's been roaming. One of the things God told me in that dream, or after the dream, is He said, Jan, my children budget. They're so accustomed to the devil stealing from them that they budget into their monthly uh, spending plan how the devil will steal from them. You see, if you and I budget to pay this and that credit and that credit, and what are we budgeting? We're budgeting to repay the thief that has stolen from us. With our knowledge, with our agreement, but he has stolen from us. And we live a reduced life from what our Father wants for us. So I've also learned that en route to the promised land, as, as Israel journeyed through the wilderness, 
God provided daily manna, so they lived hand to mouth. Now most of you sitting here, like Katinka and I, when we were in the mission field, we've experienced that. We will, we will live day to day, month to month, hand to mouth. We have a need, we pray God provides. And each one of you would have testimonies of that, of how God provided, be it in business, be it in your career, or be it in ministry. But you know, when you get to the promised land, you don't live day to day and month to month anymore. In the promised land, God teaches us to, to plow the land and sow and build and create wealth. So we don't live in that survival mode. It's okay to live in survival mode when you're en route to the promised land, but it's in the promised land when God gives you the power to create wealth. And that's what this book and this series is all about. It's the power to create wealth. I wonder if you can say this and say, God is giving me the power to create wealth. And in Deuteronomy 8 verse 18, God speaks and He says, But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who is giving you the power to create wealth, that, you may con that He may confirm His covenant which He swore to your fathers as it is today. You see, in the covenant that we have with God, we receive the power to create wealth. Now, now the word power there in the Hebrew means two things. It means ability, and it also means adaptability. Ability is the ability to be creative, to be innovative, to start a business. I've seen many business uh, people or entrepreneurs starting a business that's very lucrative, that's blossoming, that's making a lot of money, generating a lot of revenue and cash flow. And then suddenly the markets change or something changes and within a day or within a month, suddenly their business is no longer profitable and they get stuck. But God is not only giving us the ability, the word power there means ability, yes, but it also means adaptability. And I believe something is going to be activated in our hearts this weekend so that we also realize that we have access to the adaptability side of this, that we can change. When markets change, we can change. We can remain innovative. We can remain agile to apply ourselves to whatever circumstances is in front of us. And so I've, I've learned a few things in this journey. One is that Jesus says, he says in John 10 verse 10, I've come to give you life and that in abundance. There is a thief, he says, that steals, kills, and destroys. And this journey is all about closing those doors, those open doors, so that the thief can't steal anymore, and so that God can shower us with his blessings. Now, I've learned this thing, if you can put up the next slide, that abundant life consists of three facets. There's three facets to abundant life. One is as our health, one is wealth, and one is relationships. Abundant life is not only speaking about riches and money and wealth, but it deals also with our physical health, mental and emotional health, and relationships. We had this golfing friend. He was a very successful man. I think he had over 100 million rands worth of property. Um, he was set for life. He never had to work a day in his life anymore. And we were playing golf with him one day, and another pastor's friend challenged him that day, and he said, have you ever thought of this, that maybe God didn't bless you with all of this wealth just so that you can be rich? And have a comfortable life. But maybe there's a bigger purpose to your life than that. Maybe God has given you all of these things so that you can fulfill an assignment on earth. And this rich and wealthy golfing friend got so offended when, when this pastor friend of mine challenged him uh, that he whipped himself. And I promise you within six months he lost all of his wealth. His wife divorced him and he was sitting on street. You see, God had a bigger plan than just to make him rich. There was an assignment and a purpose connected to it. And that's something that we're going to learn over this weekend, that the wealth that God wants you and I to develop and, and steward and, and build and create is, is attached to the purpose and the assignment that God has for us on earth. It's not just so that we can have a comfortable life. It's not just for our own convenience, but it's for purpose. Paul writes, he says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. You see, if we pursue money with the, with the motive of chasing money, craving money, what will happen is we will pierce ourselves with many griefs. What are those piercings? Cancer at 45, because I'm so obsessed with making money and being successful in my business, is a piercing, isn't it? 
suffering a divorce at a young age or at any age because I never spent enough time with my wife, I never looked after her because I was all about making money, is a piercing. How many billionaires lie on their deathbed, Steve Jobs being one of them, and have to say, I have two regrets. I never spend enough time with my wife and with my children. Because their children don't want to talk to them and they and they on their fifth, sixth, seventh marriage. You see, if we pursue wealth or money at the cost of relationships, it's not abundant life. If we pursue wealth and money at the cost of our physical or emotional or mental health, it's not abundant life. Because we pierce ourselves with many griefs. But there is a way. There's a way to generate wealth or create wealth without the piercing. Listen to what King Solomon says in Proverbs 10, 22. He says, it's the blessing of the Lord that makes a person rich. And then he says, and he adds, no sorrows to it. We all want to be wealthy one day. But I've learned one thing, that wealth doesn't happen by chance. It just doesn't fall into my lap. Now, you know how wealth comes? It's a series of choices we make every day. You want to be healthy. You want to be fit. You want to lose maybe 10 or 20 kilos. You, you want to look like, I don't know, Brad, Brad Pitt or Aquaman. You want, want to be ripped. Okay? You, you know how you get that outcome? Not watching more of his movies. You, you won't become what you see in that context. You want to look like Aquaman. You have to go to the gym every day. Every day you need to make a decision, a disciplined decision, to build yourself into what you want to look like in the future. It is, it is small decisions, daily decisions, that change my future. And if you and I want to build wealth, if we want to, to have everything that God has in store for us, it starts with making better decisions today, every day, consistently. Abundant life is a result of accumulation of choices that I've made over time consistently. By making better decisions today, we set ourselves up for greater wealth in the future. So how do we make better decisions? How can we make better money decisions? We need the wisdom of God. And that's why you're here this weekend. That's why you're doing this series. Because you realize, I need more of God's wisdom in stewarding finances. Do you know that the, the, the Hebrew word for wisdom, Sophia, means superior intelligence? The wisdom of God gives us superior intelligence in how to steward money and how to build money and how to invest so that we can have another outcome, a better outcome to our life. And that's what this book and this series is all about, is to impart the wisdom of God. So some of you maybe have been asking, wondering, you know, you're on your way to, to the seminar. Is this book really for me? Is this series really for me? Um, I'm, I'm just going to make a few statements, and it's on the screen as well. And if any of these statements are true for you, then, then you're at the right place. Just to kind of settle your heart that you, you need to be here. Is this book for me? So, so are you struggling to survive from month to month? In other words, you live month to month, hand to mouth? Then this is for you. Are you a single parent perhaps trying to make ends meet? But great compassion and sympathy for single parents. Are you one paycheck away from defaulting? In other words, if you don't get paid at the end of the month, you're in trouble at the bank with your cars or your house. Is your bank account already empty at the second of the month? Ish. Do you feel you work all month just to pay your creditors? Should I stop? Do you feel, oh, sorry, do, you, do, you, do you fight with your spouse or your children about money at times? Do you feel that you just don't get ahead in life financially? Are you concerned that your retirement fund won't be enough? That's a big one. Do you dream of financial freedom? Do you want to invest in one of the four true wealth currencies? Do you desire to purchase your first, second, or maybe 10th or 20th property? Do you want to convert property into an income-producing asset? And are you searching for greater purpose than riches? If any of those statements is true, then I believe you're at the right place because you're going to get answers to those questions and, and, and many more. 
I've learned one thing, and that is to create wealth, I need to uncap my thinking. If, if I want to inherit everything that God has given me, if I want to build what God has given me, on, I need to change the way I think. I need to get His wisdom, His superior intelligence. Now, many years ago, scientists did an experiment, and I've used this illustration before, but they, they place fleas into a container. Now, a flea can jump about one meter high. It's, it's the animal or the organism that can jump the highest in comparison to its own size. And what these scientists did, they, they put them in the container and lit it at 30 centimeters. And what these fleas started doing was to jump 29 centimeters to avoid the risk of injury. You see, they would bump their heads a few times, and after receiving or experiencing pain, they would recondition themselves to avoid pain. After a while, the scientists removed the lid, and guess what? The fleas did. They continued jumping 29 centimeters, way below their potential because they had now been conditioned by fear and the fear of pain. And that's exactly what happens to us. We go through life and we bump our heads a few times, and we know the saying in Afrikaans, let a donkey stomp a kop, and he shall a clip twee And so the fear of bumping our heads against the same you know, limitations again cause us to withdraw and operate below our capacity and we limit ourselves and we limit God. God's plan for you will draw out the potential in you. People are not poor. This is what the Lord said to me as I wrote this book. People are not poor because they have no money but because they think poor thoughts. People are not poor because they have no money, but because they think poor thought. That's, that's why you can get one person in a, in a poor family, growing up in a poor household, rising and becoming a billionaire, and the other one, same sibling in the same house, staying in poverty. You can even get people who grow up in affluent houses and rich houses, where one rise and, and take it to the next level, and the other one end up on the street and become an addict or something like that. Why? Because of poor thoughts. As a man think of the Bible says, so he will be. You see, we can never possess that which our minds cannot process. I met a friend about eight years ago on the 4th of January. He was just starting at a new church and um, as a youth pastor. And my first question over a cup of coffee was, when are you going to buy your first property? And as soon as I asked the question, the words came out of his mouth, I will never be able to afford my own property with the salary that I'm earning. And uh, I challenged him. I said, listen, uh, and I told him the story about the fleas and challenged his mindset, and I gave him some coaching as to how he can go about to, to purchase a property and so on. And four months later, we were called to the same church, and when we arrived um, to be the executive pastors of that church, um, I found this friend looking for his own property. Nine months later, he bought his first townhouse. Two months after that, he got married. We fell in love with this beautiful girl, but she had three children. And so they wouldn't fit into his two-bedroom townhouse. And again, I coached him. And 18 months after our initial discussion, this friend of mine had his townhouse, and he bought a 2,000-square-meter property with a house, big house, and multiple flats. And today, I call him the Grand Baron von Alberton. Because he's got all these flats that he's renting out. He doesn't even pay to live in his own house. He's living for free in his house. And his tenants is paying off his house. And this is a guy who said, I will be a lifelong tenant. 18 months later, he had multiple properties with multiple streams of income. And one thing he said to me, he said that night after our first discussion, he said, Jan, I couldn't sleep. He said, that story you told me about the fleas. You know what happened? If I closed my eyes to sleep, the fleas would start jumping up and down in my head. I couldn't sleep all night long. And the Holy Spirit was just ministering to me and challenging me to break and uncap, break out of my mindset and uncap my thinking. And that's really my prayer that over this weekend, you won't be able to sleep tonight or tomorrow night for this one reason, not for mosquitoes or not, but for fleas in your head. That the Holy Spirit fleas would, would, would just trouble you to the sense that you would break through. through in your thinking, and uncap your thinking. Israel's thought, life, limited God. Listen to the scripture in Psalm 78, verse 40 to 42. God says, how often they provoked him, or Moses wrote, how often they provoked him in the wilderness, and they grieved him in the desert. Yes, again and again they tempted God, listen, and limited the Holy One of Israel. 
I think the old King James says they vexed God. They provoked God to anger. How did Israel provoke God to anger? Because they limited Him. They did not remember His power the day when He redeemed them from the enemy. You see, it vexes God when we as His children operate way below our potential. Because He knows what He's placed in us. He knows the potential that He has in us, has placed and invested in us. And when you and I operate at 30%, but we're supposed to operate at 100% because we're limiting ourselves and we're limiting our... I believe it, it vexes him. How many of you know if you've got a child that should be a medical doctor, or should be a professional, but all he wants to do is be an addict and sweep streets or whatever, you'll be angered. Something is not right. You'll be frustrated. And the Father in heaven is the same. He says, don't limit me and don't limit yourself. A friend of mine, used to do medical practice. Uh, uh, yeah, he practiced in Venna, did his hospital years there and got involved in a church there. And many years later, he was in Pretoria at Hatfield, uh, one of the pastors with me there. And, and there was this young boy from a family they ministered to in Venda. And he requested that he would come and visit uh, my friend and said, listen, can't you organize a job for me in Pretoria as a security guard? I can't find job work in Venda. I want to become a security guard. My friend said, no, I won't do that, but you can come and visit me. So he, he got him uh, to come with the bus and spend a weekend with him, and he challenged his thinking, and he gave him a business plan. And he said, listen, what you do is you go back to vendor, and you go and borrow. I'm not going to give you the money. You see, sometimes we throw money at problems, but money is the worst possible solution to most problems. He said, I'm not going to give you money, but what I want you to do is go back, and from one of your friends or your family members, borrow 200 rand, and in a week you're going to pay that back. And you go and buy bananas uh, at the market, and then you go because they were staying just adjacent to the, to the government hospital. You go and sit in front of the hospital and you sell bananas. After day one, you take all your profits and you go and buy bananas with the full sum now, which is now more than 200 rand. After day two, you do the same, and for a whole week, you do the same. At the end of the week, you repay the 200 rand, and so you continue. Within four months, this young man who wanted to become a security guard had employed 14 other people on other locations in his city selling not only bananas but all sorts of fruits. He bought his own truck to deliver and service all these points. He bought three spaza shops. His profit per month, that's his, this is 15 years ago, his profit per month, not his uh, um, turnover, his profit was 140,000 rand a month. This was the guy who wanted to become a security guard operating way below his capacity or his, or his potential. And all it took was for someone to say, let me uncap your thinking. Let the Holy Spirit uncap your mind. I know you've been bumped. I know you've been hurt. I know you've been injured and wounded. I know you've had financial disappointments, but there's so much more in you. Let's just raise the lid. Let's just remove the lid. You see, Israel vexed God. Because they limited them. They forgot what he could do. And sometimes we believe God can do it, but we don't believe he will do it in our lives. And sometimes we still believe God can do it, but we don't believe it, he can do it through us. It's not something that will just fall into your lap. I, I find the Lord blesses the work of your hands. He will give you an idea, but you have to do the work. You have to sell the bananas. You have to buy the house and convert it into flats. You have to do that. You have to farm with rabbits. You have to get the funding. You have to secure the land. But he will bless it. It's not just this magical thing that we do. No, no, no. God gives you the power, the ability, adaptability to create wealth. We need to debunk some, some money myths if we want to develop God's wisdom in creating wealth. And and, and these money myths really make us poor. And I'm just quickly going to go through it. One of the common money myths is this, that poverty is holiness. Then Africa must have been the holiest continent in the world. Number two, money is the root of all evil. Not money, but the love of money is the root of all evil. Number three, if I just try harder, things would change. Now that's the definition of insanity. 
by Albert Einstein. He said, you keep doing the same thing, expecting a different result. That's insanity. But if the game plan is wrong, it doesn't matter how well you execute it. It doesn't matter how hard you play. If the game plan is wrong, you're going to lose. And most of us don't have the right game plan when it comes to money, finances, and wealth. I have some chartered accountant friends that tell me straight like this. They said, we spent 12 years at school. We spent four to six years at university learning to do books. But we don't know how to win in this game of the economy and finances and wealth. We never, nobody wants, why? They don't want you to know how to win in the game of wealth and finances so that you remain a slave to their systems. Even the university will train you to be a professional slave. Today we've got poor slaves. They work for a day wage. If they work today, they can eat. We've got middle class slaves. We even have expensive slaves. They might earn 100 or 200 or 300 or 500,000 rand a month. But I have counseled people that earn 250,000 rand a month. And on the second day of the month, they have zero money left in their account. They saw debt counselor that charged 500 rand and requested if they can pay it off over two months because they don't have money in their accounts after the second because of all the debit orders. You see, the systems of this world, we need to understand the game and the game plan. So trying harder won't do it. We need the wisdom of God. We need the strategies of God. Number four, I just need to wait until my ship arrives. I wonder how that, that is working out for you. Okay, number five, money myth. You need a lot of money to make money. You need some money, but not really. You can make money without money. All you need is the power, the ability, and the adaptability that comes from the Lord to create wealth. Number six, six God cares more about my heart than money. No, no, God cares about money. That's why it's one of the aspects or the topics in Scripture that enjoys the most emphasis why your heart is connected to your money. Touch somebody's wallet and you touch their heart quickly. Number seven, there's nothing spiritual about money. There's a lot spirit. God says, Jesus said this, he said, if you're faithful with unrighteous money, I will give you and entrust you true spiritual riches. I think there's many more revelations and things God, God wants to release to us as his people, as his children, but we don't qualify to receive those spiritual things because we don't get the money thing right. Money is very spiritual. How we deal with money is extremely spiritual. And then the last money myth is rich folk don't really belong in God's kingdom. And I want to say that's, that's hogwash. That's rubbish. God calls everyone into his kingdom. And we're going to get to Jesus' statement where he said it's, it's more difficult for a camel to enter through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter the, into the kingdom. What he actually says is that a rich man who puts his trust in riches is difficult to enter the kingdom. But I know many rich folk, as Pastor Andre said, that really has put their trust in God, and they're great people, and they serve, and they, they found their purpose and their assignment. And so there's a place for everyone in the kingdom of God. So the last thought I want to leave with you is this. How big is your why? What is the motivation? Because when I, when I wrote this book, when God started speaking to me, I said, Lord, you have to tell me what is the purpose of wealth? Because if I don't know this, I might be deceived in this journey. And God began to reveal to me that the purpose of wealth is this, is to manifest the goodness of God on the face of the earth. <laughs> I've shared this before, but I do need to share it again. When God created everything in, in Genesis and he looked at what he created, he said, it is good, right? Every day he said, it is good. And then he made man and he placed him in the center of creation. And this time God didn't say it's good. He said, it's very good. And the word very means vehemently. It means extremely fanatically or abundantly good. In other words, when God made you, he said, you are the most fanatic expression of my goodness on the face of the earth. When God created you and he looks at you as, as a loving father, he says, you're the most extreme expression of my goodness on the face of the earth. Many years later, Moses dared to ask God. He said, show me your glory. And God said, I can't show you my glory because you'll die, but I will declare to you my glory. And he says, my glory is all about my goodness, Moses. You see, because the goodness of God is the glory of God. 
So how big is your why? Why do you want to be wealthy? Why do you want to be rich? Is it just for ourselves? Is it just to enrich ourselves? Or is it this? If we can be found faithful with money, listen, and we can become stewards of the goodness of God, which is the glory of God on the face of the earth. How will the glory of God, the knowledge of the glory of God, cover the earth like the waters cover the sea? How will that happen? Is when you and I become faithful stewards of His goodness on earth. The word goodness in the Greek is agathos. Many of us know the term agapai. Agapai means unconditional love. But agathos, which is the goodness of God, means the unconditional goodness of God. Now, we, we, we're starting to grasp unconditional love. We love our children unconditional, but we're not unconditionally good to our children because we work on a reward system. Carrot and a stick, we call it. Okay? We punish them if they do bad, and we reward them if they do good. That's the environment we live in. But have you ever thought of this, that God's goodness is unconditional? On the best days, I struggle to fathom that. And God will be good to me even when I'm bad. And isn't that our testimony? How oftentimes does God bless us even when we do bad things, even when we don't do the things that we know we should be doing? God's goodness is unconditional. He lets the rain fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. How big is your why? Does your why end with yourself? Does your why end with enriching yourself and living a comfortable life? Or can you... Expand your why to say, Lord, I want to become a faithful steward of money so that you can entrust to me true spiritual riches, which is to be a custodian of your goodness on earth. Goodness and generosity is synonymous. And as we are generous to others, we manifest the goodness of God. We manifest the glory of God. And so we want to go into a time of discussing some of the things we've learned tonight in this session in, in smaller groups. And so... Remember to register for this series, order the handbook and join a small group by contacting info at cohcc.net or 79 520 Help us spread this message by sharing it on Facebook or by making a financial donation with the reference well.